So I wanted to kind of open up by talking about the curatorial framework for the exhibition. Zeal, I know that you led the charge in terms of organizing the show. Can you talk about how you chose the artists and then how you chose the layout of the exhibition? Okay, wow, curatorial framework, big words. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is my first time organizing an art show um, and so um, it makes it sound like, I, I feel like it makes it sound like I did more than maybe what I did was come up with the idea and invite uh, three people whose work I really loved that I felt was in the same context as what I was doing, which is storytelling and painting. So um, we ended up with a, with a three-person exhibit, which is Lauren Holland and Lily Bernard. Lily and I have a, a close relationship as artist friends, and we, we both have MFAs in art. Mine is in studio art, and Lily's is in uh, public practice. Mm -hmm. and we experience many of the same things, which is kind of like a, a, marginaliz a marginalization or a rejection of our work in some way, or at least that's how we felt, because it's narrative and because we um, have a commitment to painting black characters into our artwork. I call mine characters, um, she may call her, she refer, may refer to the figures in her work differently, mm -hmm. but I come from a TV and theater and film background, like entertainment to some extent, and I'm also very much into literature, so I do think of what I'm doing as storytelling, and I use a lot of the language that's literary language when I think about my work hmm. and talk about it. So you talked about you know one of the kind of common factors, like you said, is being storytelling. Um, but now the show has been open for about a week. Um, have you noticed and seeing all the work together? Have you noticed any other commonalities, or have you seen any other? And Laura, please chime in if if there are things that you've seen. Like I didn't realize we all did this in common, or we're all thinking about this, or. Um, I just wanted to know if, like I said, now the show is open and you three have been really chatting about the show, um, if there are th more things you've found that, that are in common. Um. Do you want to answer next? Hmm. <laughs> I definitely think one of the commonalities that, once all the work came to the sh uh, into the space that I saw, was the fact that we were all interested in representations that either were invisible, representations that were pushed to the side, um, and just bringing a voice to a side of black women that's not usually seen. Um, even with Zeal's work in particular, where she's di distinctively grabbing it from the media. This is thing these are things that have media coverage. She brings a more human aspect to it. She brings a more personal aspect to it, whereas it's kind of dehumanized in the, in the news. We're kind of represented as these you know, grotesque characters that always are in these negative situations, and Zeal brings a more lifelike and more realistic approach to it. Um, Lily as well, she's definitely bringing a more spiritual side and a side of things that people don't see. And myself, I'm always interested in telling stories that people don't see or bringing the experience that people don't know that we share. Mm -hmm. I think that I, I, once I saw all of the work in here and actually had conversations with Lauren, I realized even more um, that there was more crossover than I even thought um, in terms of like, um, our interest in folklore mm -hmm. and the African diaspora and religions of the African diaspora. Even if it doesn't always directly come into the work, it's something that we do think about. For mm -hmm. example, in this piece here, Lauren looked at it and she was like, oh, it's an Airsley magic wand. And I was like, oh, you looked at the title? She was like, no, I just know what it is. <laughs> uh, I mean, how many people in here know that that's an Airsley wand? One person? Maybe? Okay. Two? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some of us must be on that same voodoo frequency. <laughs> so it is a sacred symbol from Haitian voodoo, and it, um, I've, I've adapted it and adjusted it somewhat. So um, it's not exactly what the symbol looks like, but from what I, what I understand, having been in Haiti and talking to people who actually paint and make the symbols, that each person has their own little flavor or style, a distinct way of doing it. I'm really intrigued by both of your processes, right? The way in which you uh, communicate these different ideas. Um, starting with Lauren, I would love to hear about your process, um, and not only just in terms of what you paint, um, but scale um, and color as well. Okay, so I take a more traditional approach to creating artworks and telling stories. I have a painting and draw, first drum painting and drawing background, and that's where I'm MFA, started. Yale. <laughs> 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 it. It. Um, I mean, I look at literature is a really big part of where I draw inspiration from, but I translate it using very traditional methods. Um, 
whether it's like traditional underpaintings and building up paintings using epic scale um, that usually was reserved for history painting and other things that were important and monumental, whereas black people usually aren't seen as important and monumental, so by increasing them to that scale, uh, I'm, I'm taking advantage of that using um, symbolism and other things. Uh, drawing, drawing is a preparatory method I usually use, but sometimes they develop into their own works like those two, and um, whereas paintings I like to be a bit more traditional and focus on things that people can directly relate to through our history. Drawings are a bit more experimental. I can try things out, see how they look, see what the effect is, and just be a little more free. Hmm. Uh, maybe it might be interesting to kind of take us through the process using one of the paintings. So maybe the one with the, um, the woman with the earphones um, on the bottom. Oh, okay. um, so you're talking about you know, drawing inspiration from literature. Was there something in particular that you were uh, reading or listening to when you created that work? So it, right now I've been drawing a lot from classical literature. Um, this series is largely inspired by Greek mythology, classical Greek and Roman mythology. That one, she's a naiad, she's a river deity. Um, and actually everything starts out as text. I start off researching and looking things up, I write it out, I have pages in my studio of text, 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 text. <laughs> then it translates into sketches and drawings and adjusting things and then eventually it makes its way into painting form. Um, so yeah, that one started off as a series of texts. Oh wow. <laughs> and then, but does each character, do you refer to them as characters? I mean each one? I, protagonists, okay. like, like mm -hmm. novels. So, um, wow. And then does each protagonist have their own kind of storyline? I mean is it something that we could, viewers could follow or? They do. They're not direct stories as much as Zeal's and Lily's, it's much more associative. I tend to work with symbolic association, the same way that media and advertising do, but also the way that allegorical painting did. You could associate certain attributes to characters based on what was around them. So based on the particular elements, I could lead people to think certain things about these characters. So with the Naiad, for instance, even though she's a mermaid for starters, which takes her out of the realm of reality and puts her into the realm of the exotic. She's something that is kind of sexually lusted after. She's beautiful, she's perfected. But at the same time, because she's a black mermaid, and black women's usually associated with this kind of deviant sexuality, this mm -hmm. negative portrayal, I've associated her with things that are filthy, and things that are dangerous, and there's garbage, there's skulls, there's other things. In reality, these are not really things associated with her. They're things that are put near her, put on her. And I kind of was trying to represent that by her being a contemporary mermaid, she's listening to her music, minding her own business, even though all of this stuff has been kind of tossed at her. So, which is kind of the experience that some of us go through in reality. So it's, it's much more associative. And each story that comes out of uh, my paintings it really depends on the viewer. It depends on their own background and their own knowledge. And I try to add layers and layers and layers of meaning so that everybody can get some sort of meaning from it, but there's a lot there usually. And then how do you determine scales? You said there's so much packed into one painting. Um, how do you determine how large or small they, they end up becoming? Um, if it were up to me, every single piece would be monumental in size. They'd all be like 10 feet by, yeah. Sometimes with some of the smaller ones that have been happening, I have about six going at a time, so I reduce them so that I can actually have space to make them. Also, it depends on the nature of the story. If it's a more monumental story that I'm relating to, I will go bigger. If it's more of a thought or a poem or an idea, it will go smaller. We were talking a little bit earlier and you were saying you don't necessarily like to give up the secret sauce of what, uh, what goes into making your work, but I'm going to ask anyway just in case. Um, can you take us through your process? Okay, so I just wanted to say that um, I saw Lauren's paintings first at the Santa Monica Museum in a solo exhibit in the project room a few years ago. Yeah, and I just love, love, love the, her work. I just thought it was sexy and it was just well done, well made and beautiful. and. Um, so I, I don't feel like I adequately, adequately answered the question you first asked me about okay. that. So I, I remembered Lauren's paintings and I always wanted to exhibit with her and mm -hmm. that's the other reason why I invited her to participate. Oh. 
<laughs> so I was surprised just now when she said that she writes out things before she makes her paintings and she refers to her characters as protagonists because so do I. Well, <laughs> one more coming out. Yes, yeah. definitely. I, I definitely think of my, usually they're black women or girl characters and I think of them specifically as protagonists and that they have a goal or an objective and, um, and I want to see more of those, not just in artwork, which there are very few mm -hmm. in artwork, but also in, in uh, popular culture, in media, so in movies, in novels, you know, in songs, that kind of thing. And not just the same characters we see all the time, <laughs> not just like yeah. the movie yeah. and the sapphire. Yeah. Um, I think what we all want to do is bring new dimensions to how black women are viewed. And, and we also want other people to see how we view the world. So mm -hmm. it's not just about showing black women. It's not just about being black women, but it's also that black women have um, experiences and have opinions and um, advice about everything in the world. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so I actually want to talk through maybe two different works because I'm, I'm very intrigued by the um, narrative, like literally seeing text on the piece. Mm -hmm. So thinking along the lines of saying showing black women in very different ways, maybe thinking about the piece as on the far end um, with the four African American women. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about, I guess, your thoughts behind that piece, but also how you made the piece? Okay, so that particular artwork is called Sweet Sticky Things, just like the exhibit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and um, that one is actually based on a, a, a viral social media photo. <laughs> and it had, like, I don't know, thousands of views. And I just loved the picture. I just kept looking at it and laughing, looking at it, laughing, looking at it, laughing. And I was like, one day I was like, you know what? I'm going to paint them. <laughs> and for me, it was really just a celebration of black women's sass and sexuality. It's really that simple. Um, I did actually attempt to complicate the original image a bit, mm -hmm. so I added some costume props. There I go with my entertainment language. <laughs> so that each woman kind of had appeared a little bit more distinctive. Okay. And the interesting thing is I've had this photo for a long time. I like printed out a color uh, photo, put it on my wall, and sometimes my friends would come to my house. The male friends would say, oh, you got strippers on the wall? And I was like, those aren't strippers. <laughs> and they would be like, uh, yes, they are. <laughs> and I'm still not sure. So, but it didn't really matter to me. What I appreciated there was their boldness mm -hmm. and their um, their pride in their bodies, no body shame, um, just attitude. And um, so to go back to the process, which you asked me, um, so I make a painting on um, fiberless paper. It's kind of plasticky. And so I make the painting with the idea that it's going to end up on the fabric. So there is a digital process that it goes through, and I do guide the, um, the artwork through that. So I do make a painting. And so I still think of it as painting, even though it's on fabric, but I know that it can be read a lot of different ways. It can be, someone could approach it and say, oh, this, this is interesting, it's digital artwork, it's digital fine art artwork. Someone could also approach the work and say, oh, this is kind of textile art, this is quilting. Another person could say, oh, it's kind of like illustration or graphic novels. And then, of course, I identify as a painter because that's the history that I'm most engaged with. It's mm -hmm. what I know the most about. Hmm. Um, but yeah, we have vernacular illustrative language around us every day, and, that, uh, and I do pull from that and use it in my work. Hmm. And then you embellish, like with the lace that's all around, that, that comes afterwards. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you make decisions around adding those kinds of pieces. Just like when you're done, you feel like, okay, it needs something else. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, I've been in, I've been working in this mode for um, a few months, so this is relatively new. Mm -hmm. And so, for this particular show, this is the first time I've ex exhibited the work with um, something added to it other than just the original fabric, mm -hmm. and it's something I like to continue exploring more. Mm -hmm. And then um, the piece on the back wall um, with the an kind of older woman and a young girl. Um, I want to just bring up that one because, it, again, just seeing text directly onto the work. Um, I'm very intrigued. A lot, some of them were stories. Sometimes they're pieces of advice, the conversations between two people. Um, I'm assuming you start out by writing the text itself, or do the images come first and then you write the text? Um, typically, I'm having a conversation with someone, and then the, it comes to my mind. Like I see, I see the pictures, and then they just keep burning and I want to make it into artwork. And so then I do typically write things down. I write text down, I do a thumbnail sketch. Um, I do a drawing. Um, I change the scale, the scale or the size of the drawing, enlarge it or make it smaller, and then make a painting. So, so in this case, this is a directly autobiographical artwork. It, it's called um, 
Parable of Black Governance. Um, I know that, well, one of my favorite writers is Octavia Butler, so I knew that some people would approach the artwork and think, oh, like Parable of the Sower or Parable of the Talents. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not really a science fiction, but I just knew that that word parable also is <coughs> biblical, so people would bring that to it as well. Um, I grew up in a town, it wasn't really a black town, but my experience was like it was a black town. <laughs> <laughs> and I grew up next to Hampton University in Virginia. Oh, okay. And I was kind of hit by a car when I was four, which is what that painting is about. How do you kind of? Uh, yeah, because I don't actually remember <laughs> the car. I was like, oh, got it, okay. <laughs> and so that's what this painting is about. It's about, you know, this experience of being a little girl and having this, this incident happen. But it's really more about the fact that my, um, I, I couldn't walk for a week after that. My grandmother was raising me. She um, had to carry me and she was elderly and obese. And um, she actually, uh, about a week later, um, the person who was driving the car came to the house to visit. I, I imagine they had a conversation at some point and he came over to apologize. Wow. And he stayed for a long time. He took off his hat and he was very respectful. And I never saw him again. And I, I was only four, but I think about it as an adult now, and I wanted to make a painting about this experience of, you know, a uh, you know, black police officer with a gold tooth and Jerry Curl, you know, helping out, being there at the right time, um, and like how this, how this whole incident played out with, um, you know, taking care of each other in a community and, um, uh, and self-governance. How did you? I was in the room. Oh, okay. No, I'm just, I mean, if you're four, and so I'm, you know, oh. I can't even remember what I did last week, let alone when I was a kid, when I was four, so I just kind of imagine if there was any like, kind of embellishment. How did you, like, your grandmother kind of, like, retell this story, you know, later, you, you really remember? I remember him. Wow. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Like I said, last month is fuzzy, so I'm like, <laughs> so I just got a furious, wow. And is, is all of the, the text in your works um, something personal to you? Are these all things, that conversation that you said that there's, a lot of them start from conversation, but I'm just kind of looking at some of the other ones, whether they're between male and female, or you know, mother and daughter, or I was just wondering if they're, they're all. Sometimes they're, some are more personal than others. Some are more directly autobiographical. Some are made up dialogue, like fictionalized. Open the conversation by talking about um, the kind of curatorial framework for the exhibition and how the show was laid out and the commonalities between each artist. Um, and then we open to talking about process. Um, so I'd love to hear more about your process. Um, does it start with um, an idea? Does it start with uh, reading something, a song? Um, for you, kind of how does your uh, process begin in terms of creating a painting? Well, um, my works are historical and very religious based. So I do do a lot of research, I do a lot of reading, and um, I come from a family of historians. My father's a historian and my grandfather was a Mambi. The Mambises were the insurgent soldiers in Cuba that fought in the War of Independence from Spain and he was a war correspondent and his writings are in the libraries of Cuba so I read his writings which help me and then I also visit with Baba Laos. Baba Laos is our high priest in the Yoruba faith called Ifa and Ifa is a religion that the enslaved Africans brought with them from Cuba so I have some Baba Lao friends, the high priest and from I can Africa. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah he said from Cuba. Yeah, from Africa. Africa. Sorry. <laughs> Nigeria. Mm -hmm, the Nigeria region. And so, um, so I consult with them so that my work is authentic and that it doesn't offend the ancestors. And so I actually like make Orisha charts. You know, Orishas are Yoruba yeah. deities. And I make Orisha charts, and the charts uh, have things that pertain to each Orisha, which are numbers, colors, um, animal familiars. Um, uh, habitats and then uh, a wonderful thing that the ancestors did in, in Cuba and the Caribbean was in order to um, avoid prosecution they disguised the names of Orishas behind Catholic saints right. that had similar characteristics so when they were really venerating Elegua for example and Elegua has a lot of characteristics with the Christ child so they syncretized him with the Christ child and then the slave master would come and and they're singing Elewa, Elewa, and they've got a picture of the Christ child. And then the slave master's like, why are you singing Elewa to the Christ child? I'm like, oh, that's how you say Christ in Yoruba. <laughs> <laughs> so that was really creative. And so I have to also read about Christianity. So for example, the painting I did of uh, the Blessed Mother, Kachita Ochun and the Dragon is just really taken straight out of the Book of Revelations. Oh, wow. And it's also codified with the, you know, the Afro-Caribbean 
so my process involves a lot of that and then a lot of prayer. I pray a lot, I burn incense, and a lot of my images come to me in my sleep. Wow. They wake me up from my sleep. Wow. Do you consult the Babalao while you're making the work as oh, well or yes. just in the beginning? Uh, all, all the way through and, and some things are like taboos, you know, like you shouldn't paint a black cat with a certain orisha or, you know, so I don't want to paint taboos, I don't want to offend the ancestors. I want, every work is not just a religious process for me, a spiritual process. I, I, I um, weep a lot when I paint them, um, but then it's also, um, I want, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, bring the conversation of the Afro, the creolization of religion uh, that's, you know, big in my, I was born in Cuba. I want to bring that into the conversation in America. And then, of course, inserting the, nar the slave narrative, which is omitted from, you know, the annals of our art history. So, um, yeah, it's prayerful for me. And I'm just curious in terms of time. I mean, you know, obviously this, the consultation, the, um, you know, it, it seems like it's a very physical process in terms of painting the work. Um, so oftentimes, how long does it usually take to complete a work? Yeah, a long. You like, I've got, um, I have my first solo show coming up in um, Museum of African Diaspora in San Francisco, and they have uh, a lot of my work in that they're days. installing. Yeah, it's, it's opening in a few days. It's running through the end of, of, of June. But for example, I have these very large antebellum. I call them antebellum appropriations because I alter classical European paintings. I use the classical European painting as a sort of trope by which to um, draw in the European crowd to be able to talk about slavery and rape and orishas. And those take me hundreds of hours, somewhere like 300 hours. <laughs> I don't have wow. any assistance, so I do it by myself. Lily both you know, depict the female form often not nude, but you know, there's some parts of their body that are exposed. Mm -hmm. um, why, why is it important, I guess, to um, it, you know just to have a, a bit of femininity or sometimes even sexuality um, involved in your work? So for me, sexuality, it's a double-edged sword when representing African American women because on the one hand, we are very frequently hypersexualized and seen as, again, these exotic playthings. But uh, part of my work also tries to show uh, beauty of black women. We are beautiful and so I relate it to classical beauty standards. The classical beauty standard is the classical nude. It's the, we see nude statues of women. We see them as perfecting. We see them as goddesses and nymphs and other things that are idealized. So I'm translating um, the image of the black women into this idealized form, which I see us already as an idealized form. And it's um, other influences that see, that kind of drag us back down into the murky depths of other negative imagery, if you will. Um. Uh, for me, I try to um, represent as many types of black women as possible. So for me, it's about trying to show that we have different shapes, different sizes, different ways of thinking about our bodies, different ways of moving through the world. Um, so there are some paintings where um, the vulnerability of the woman is obvious. Um, in the case of Sweet Sticky Things, they're vulnerable and strong at the same time. Um, and um, maybe it's not so evident in all of these paintings, but in the body of my work, you can see various representations of women, and that's very important to me. And people do ask me, like when I was making this, people, a couple of my friends were like, are you concerned with how people are gonna perceive this based upon commodification of women's bodies and other kind of like code terms that people use to talk about, you know, certain kinds of like uh, feminist issues. Mm -hmm. And um, again, it's my intention to show many different types of women. And I think that it, that's more of the problem than anything else. That we only have a few representations mm -hmm. in popular culture of black women and they're pretty narrow stereotypes. And so, yeah. Um, and with me, I, um, not a lot of what they said, uh, but I also like to bring in uh, autobiographical uh, mm -hmm. into the um, into the nude black woman. I, I gave birth to six children in ten years' time. My OBGYN was here. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Carol Jordan Harris is actually also an African uh, chief. Uh, she does a lot of uh, charitable work in Africa. Uh, she's also um, a, a, a well, well um, experienced art collector. But wow. she did see all of my six children before I ever saw them. Oh. So, <laughs> and um, so, you know, uh, through Dr. Jordan Harris, and she has three children of her own and nine grandchildren. 
you know, that there is a beautiful sensuality, a beautiful sexiness, a beautiful femi uh, feminism in being a woman. And part of the part of the arguments uh, with the, which I engaged in graduate art school was that, you know, that uh, being a mother was anti-feminist, and that we were relegated. You're a mother. You yeah. know that we're relegated to these menial tasks. And I kept arguing, oh, contraire. Right. You know, there's nothing more feminist and more powerful than you know. Than not only bringing a life into this world, but raising feminist men, for example. Yeah. You've got that opportunity as a mother. So that I do. And so then in the nude body, you see often leaking nipples because, you know, when my babies cried, my breast yeah. milk was leaking. You see stretch marks. <laughs> you know, you see all this that I think is still very beautiful. And so I do tend to be very maternal in my, nude, uh, my nudity. Mm -hmm. As Dr. Jordan Harris can relate to. <laughs> 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 She's like, Mom. <laughs> so embarrassing, <laughs> man. <laughs> Um, but besides this kind of celebration and diversity of black womanhood, there's also, you know, some political conversations happening. Um, and I'm particularly thinking about your Latasha Harlins. Yes. Um, which clearly, you know, is, we've got a great um, shout out in the, in the Huffington Post uh, review. Yeah. Um, but just to kind of talk about, I mean, I think a lot of people are finally, you know, having this renewed attention to um, not just the invisibility, but also the killing of African American women. Right. So you could talk about the process in making that work, and then um, even with Zeal's work, you know, kind of seeing, you know, seeing Trump <laughs> right here, but then also this is a pretty politically um, charged work. So just kind of talking about that flip side of Black womanhood. I'll let Zeal go first since I just spoke. Yeah. Uh, okay. This this particular artwork is called um, the Turkish <laughs> Language of a Free Traveler, and um, I saw. An Ethiopia, a painting in the National Museum of Ethiopia. It was an image, and I really like how it was set up. And it was set up similar, to, similarly to this. Um, I'm also aware of Harriet Powers' quilts, like the oldest surviving quilts by African Americans, and Faith Ringgold's work, mm -hmm. and um, Haitian sequin voodoo drapeau. So somewhere between all of those things and the idea of like storyboarding and illustration and painting is where this painting sits. And um, what I really wanted to do was to show various scenes from 2015 to 2017 um, of the political uh, climate of this era. And for me, um, especially in 2015 and 16, there, was, there were a lot of stories of um, police violence incidents. And so I concentrated on two stories that had black girls at the center, actually a young woman, and, and a teenager. So that's the McKinney Pool Party in Texas and Corinne Gaines in Baltimore. And uh, so I wanted to, I knew I wanted to deal with fire and water at the same time, this coming of age in this era for young black children and teens. And um, so, so I, I have scenes re repeating of the pool party where the kids are just playing and swimming. And then I also have a representation of Corinne Gaines um, and you can see that she's armed and her kid is behind her. She was um, killed by police in a standoff in Baltimore. Um, things began um, when she was pulled over by police for driving her car with a cardboard license plate that said Free Traveler. So hence the title of the artwork. Um, she had paperwork problems and the paperwork problems escalated. A few months later, uh, there was a call um, that uh, there could be a domestic violence incident in the house. I believe, I'm not 100% certain. People can fact check me. <laughs> uh, and she, her boyfriend left the house with one of the kids and she stayed in with the other. And the standoff went for a few hours and then a policeman entered the home and killed her. The, her son was harmed, but he didn't die. And um, this, this caused a huge social media, you know, um, conversation right and it was the first time that um, something like this was streamed live on Facebook and so the police contacted Facebook and asked them to take the live stream down because people were encouraging her to do what she was doing because they saw her as a soldier against the police mm -hmm. so and that's how she perceived herself kind of like um, almost like in a, in a weird <coughs> not quite way like a like a Black Panther alone you know doing something, uh -huh. a vigilante, that's a way better word, a vigilante on her own fighting against the system. So, um, does that answer the question? Yeah, just kind of curious about the relationship but just, um, with that and then um, with what happened in Texas and the pool party incident. Oh, okay, so 
Um, and so in, in the pool party incident, what happens is that there's a young teenage girl who um, is, she gets thrown down on the ground by a white male police officer and um, he pulls a gun on the teenagers. Incidentally, the, the, the teenager who actually recorded what happened was a white boy and he, there's only one interview of him where someone came to him for about three minutes to ask what happened. And it's really interesting if anyone is really interested in the story to hear his point of view as well. But um, uh, so this was again like a huge news story that brought a lot of people to outrage. Also what was happening is that the riots happened in Baltimore and Freddie Gay, uh, after Freddie Gray's funeral, um, fires were set in Baltimore. So the scenes are Texas and Baltimore mostly. And so again, that's where the fire and the water come into play. Lauren, we were talking about how you see yourself working in bodies of work um, in series. <laughs> and I was actually surprised to know that you actually see this as an, is this one series? Uh, the paintings are all part of one series. The drawings are a little bit more tests. Okay, so the two larger works on this wall are actually studies. Mm -hmm. Okay, because at first I was like, oh, you know, maybe she's kind of working with a new technique where she's kind of ghosting some of her figures. Um, why did you, I guess, I don't say feel comfortable, but why did you decide to just to show work in process? <laughs> um, with the drawings, because in general my paintings tend to be very finished, they tend to follow very traditional processes. Drawings allow me to be a bit more experimental and try out new forms. Um, I can test out colors, I can test out techniques. With the, the sirens in particular, I deliberately left a lot of it unfinished because I kind of liked the effect that it created. Mm -hmm. It created a sense of distance, it created a sense of poetry. I am a traditionalist. Uh, drawings are kind of lesser in my book anyway, so uh, it just was more free. It was something I can play with a little bit and enjoy. So if the women are seen as protagonists, what are the men? Are they the antagonists? <laughs> 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 There's the one little guy over here. Like, accessories. <laughs> right. I didn't hear that. They're supporting They're supporting <laughs> it's so the supporting roles, uh, but they're still seem in a positive light. I mean, they're not necessarily they are, seen. They are, they're equal. I mean, I mean, they, carry, they carry their own set of yeah. stereotypes, their own set of images, their own set of problems. It's just that usually, I feel like they get a lot more attention than the black female body does. So they are the they're the support. They're the good husbands. They're <laughs> <laughs> and it also relates to relationships too. Like sometimes I expand on um, the idea of the, the black relationship, which is also never seen in a very positive light. It's usually seen as tinged with violence. The man just isn't there. Or so I again, their their the positive supporting role shows how I've experienced black men in my life. They were always there. My, my fathers, my uncles, my brothers, and his wife. I mean. So they're there. They're a positive role in black female life. They're not just these deadbeats in jail or killing people. They're, they are there. <laughs> yeah. But there does seem, a, seem to be a bit of tension. And it, just, like, it seems to me right, that, that, that Homegirl's kind of given the, guy, the, the supportive character <laughs> the side eye, and he's going to pay a little bit more attention to this other woman. <laughs> So it seems to be a dynamic right. playing out there. That, that one, yeah. Because again, there's playing with the idea of like do you get relationships a little bit. So we've got instead of just two people, we've got three people going on. It's a little bit of little triangle. Yes. Got it. <laughs> but then what I've noticed from your work over the years is that they are, they seem to always be the, the you know, protagonists seem to be in the more fantastical environments, right? These kind of like forests or somewhere that's not kind of more traditional home or something like that. Um, and I um, assume this is part of this larger story that you're that you're crafting. Um, but do you want viewers to know any more than that? There, there are these kind of fantastical environments that um, are not necessarily recognizable. Like I can't say, oh, that is this place. Yeah, no, no, no. I do not intend for them to be specific places because, again, if you specifically locate things, it becomes easier for people to say this is this story. And I like to keep things a lot more ambiguous. And mm -hmm. since I'm relating to mythology, and relating to narrative, and relating, relating to ideals, it's more of a mythic ideal. So there are these pristine landscapes that are perfect and beautiful and kind of eerie. Uh, and they're also kind of metaphors for the women themselves sometimes. These kind of unnaturally, beautifully, 
perfect places that have been, again, have had garbage thrown at them and have been destroyed and intruded upon in some way. Mm -hmm. I just want to say thank you so much to Zeal Harris for organizing this yes. show. I don't know if you guys are aware that she organized it. Yeah. And she did a phenomenal job. <laughs> and thank you to James Pinoso, the gallery owner, for hosting us. Yay. So um, it's not easy what Zeal did. And, um, and it's very important what she's doing mm -hmm. in terms of you know, bringing the the black uh, woman narrative exactly. into a mainstream art place um, through the lens of black women artists. And mm -hmm. you're doing that yourself at Cam, and I want to Thank applaud you. you. <laughs> Thank you. You know, with Genevieve's show, and then also Kenyatta's show, these two black women whom, whom she featured in solo shows. Thank and you. they do that. They celebrate uh, black womanhood and the black figure. And it's a critically important piece because like Kenyatta A.C. Hinkle's show, The Evanescence, it's talking about, you know, not just the disappearance of women, but in general, the void of the black yeah. well, female figure in the annals of art history. Mm -hmm. uh, the closest, I think, that we can think of is like, Picasso's European women in African masks in the Daughters of Avignon, right? That's about as close as we get to black women on canvas during you know, these critical classical European uh, periods. And so we, you know, Kenyatta A.C. Hinkle, Genevieve, Kara Walker, Micheline Thomas, Lauren Holland, Zeal Harris, myself, we're playing a really critical role in inserting the black, the presence of the black female figure in the annals of our history. So this is critical what we're doing here, and, it, and, it's, and it's important. And so I took it very seriously and um, what I like to do for group shows is uh, do a piece specific for a group show. And so the piece I really wanted to do for this group show is Latasha Harlan's piece. Now, it directly relates to this autobiographical piece over there that's full of sequent. And that actually does also, whereas it's um, abstract, it's not the human figure, it does speak of black on black love. And Zeal Harris and I have had conversations that black on black heterosexual love is generally not tolerated in the mainstream art, stream, art scene. I think right. in the avant-garde. Avant oh, well, yeah, 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 if, if, yeah. if you look at those black artists who are in the mainstream, who are A-list artists, they do not have heterosexual romantic partners. And so I think in like black popular art, we should, we, are, we should distinguish this for our audience because it, yeah. there is a very much a difference between black popular art like Cynthia St. James and Charles Bibbs, which many black people grow up seeing and having in their homes and you know buying on the street which is different from often where <laughs> we're <laughs> I don't mean to say it like that because I love them I've exhibited in Charles Gallery City of St. James has curated me in shows and called me a protege at one point in time but there is a distinct difference between black popular art and what we do and we bring more specificity to our work and it is not generalized it's actually very specific and you know, we're every, each each and every painting we try to bring a brand new world to what we're doing. And as one of my art mentors said, Mark Bradford, who's a, an A-list uh, artist who sells his paintings for millions, he told he talked about this during. Um, uh, a Baila uh, Black Artists in Los Angeles roundtable that we had at California African American okay. Museum. And he said there's a black art world and a white art world. And that is true. And that's what mm -hmm. Zeal is talking about. And so what we are attempting to do is what we have done here today. We have crossed over to <laughs> the white art world by being present in this gallery. Thank you to Zeal Harris. But, but this um, artwork over there, um, the glittery one, it's a self-portrait and it's called Yemaya, who is an Orisha. Yemaya, uh, self-portrait is Yemaya under attack. And it is a, a painting about family because my husband is underneath there and the six fish represent my children. That relates, relates directly to the Latasha Harlan story because that's autobiographical, autobiographical about some trauma that I was experiencing in the early 1990s where I was, you know, mentored as a daughter to a very famous celebrity and there was a lot of betrayal and then he drugged and raped me. And what helped to um, keep me alive, literally, because when he threatened my life, um, when my husband and I, because I came home drugged by him to my husband and we confronted him together, and when he threatened both of our lives and continued to threaten my life, I became suicidal. Mm -hmm. And uh, what really helped to keep me alive is that I was mentoring local kids in my neighborhood in Harlem, and they were 14 and 15 year old kids. And so here we are in March 1991, and we find out that in California, uh, a little 15 year old girl who had just turned 15 two months prior by the name of Latasha Harlins was killed. Mm -hmm. and, and the way that they, um, uh, vilified her. You know, she is a victim. The Korean store grocer made the first assault. You see in the video very clearly that she grabs Latasha and yanks her over the counter. And like any person would do, Latasha defended herself, you know. Right. And so she punched her. And then the Korean store owner, owner threw a, a stool at her. And the stool knocked down the orange juice, which she was attempting to purchase. She had the money in her hand. And when Latasha put up the, uh, you know, she turned around 
you know, the, the lady brandished the gun. And what I learned in meeting Latasha's family is that this woman had been harassing Latasha and her friend Ty, who's on her way, uh, for years since they were little, that she was bullying them. Yes, her defense is that she was bullied by male gangsters in the neighborhood, that she turned around and bullied Latasha, brandishing the gun on her several times and calling her the N-word and, and just really victimizing these poor girls. And so just a couple of weeks ago, the Community Coalition, in, mm -hmm. uh, that's, it's an organization that was founded by Karen Bass, mm -hmm. a politician named Karen Bass, they commissioned me to do a piece on Latasha Harlings. And so during the 1990, in, in 1991, when I was mentoring these children to stay alive, to not kill myself, we talked so much about Latasha because they were 14 and 15 and, and they were black Harlem kids and we were terrified for the the way that they just, you know, again, vilified her, they devalued her, 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 child, her childhood, and, and we ha were having critical conversations about Latasha. On top of that, I was uh, uh, a member of the Abyssinian Baptist Church Gospel Choir, and the Abyssinian Baptist Church was Adam Clayton Powell Jr.'s church. It was around the corner from my house, and uh, Reverend Butts is, a, is an activist. And so the church was talking about Latasha, Latasha, Latasha. She was big on, 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 on our thoughts and on our hearts, and I just, always wanted to do an artwork about Latasha to honor and, 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 and commemorate her. And so what I wanted to show in this painting of Latasha is not Latasha at, you know, being killed, but the beautiful child that she was. She was a child and she was beautiful. I mean, when I painted that, I spent like four hours crying because she was just so beautiful and perfect and innocent. And, and, and that's what I wanted to portray, that she was a child and she was innocent and beautiful. Now she's in heaven. And whereas the other one I made for Community Coalition is full of all this, you know, the community, the family, the, the um, Los Angeles Times clippings. This is just pure azure blue because she's in heaven now where there are no worldly problems. And the Orishas, Siete Potencias Africanas is just a, a Santeria or Orisha thing that I can talk about later, but that's, on it, but I think you were about to introduce make an introduction. I Denise Harlins yes. is here. <laughs> for the audience. And your daughter is behind you. And um, thank you for coming. Yeah. No, we've had, um, you know, at, at CAM, as you know, uh, we have an exhibition up uh, called No Justice, No Peace, LA 1992. Um, it was curated by Tyree Boyd Pates, and I know he's also, Tyree's also been in touch with the family, and they've been very generous um, to uh, lend um, objects from uh, Latasha, um, you know, journals and t-shirts and all that great stuff. And so there's been so many people have been coming to the museum that either didn't know about Latasha's life, because it just happened so quickly after um, the Rodney King incident, um, but just because of just time and, you know, there's so many other incidents that are happening, um, that there's having like this renewed engagement um, with her legacy, and I've had, we had so many visitors that are just completely touched, blown away, I and mean, we've had people cry. I mean, we, we've really had um, people really moved, I think, by, by her story. Um, and th this awareness that um, black women have been, you know, victimized for years. I mean, you know, people know it, but it's like, this is kind of a reminder that, that young women, um, in particular, um, are just being, you know, victimized every single day. So, um, and just like, one thing I want to say yeah. really quickly: the very important thing about that story that yes, Latasha was killed less than like 13 days after Rodney King was beaten on video, but there was a judge, Carlin. Mm -hmm. uh, the, so the jury decided that she would receive six. That the, the, the killer, the, uh, who was a Korean woman, would receive 16 years, which is the maximum amount of time for what they consider to be a. Um, voluntary manslaughter and the judge a white woman whose father was a you know a rich you know CEO for Warner Brothers or something like that just knocked that all down and said no involuntary manslaughter no jail time yeah. five hours of probation four hundred dollars of community service and five hundred dollar fine and that was it and so that I mean she is now reinforcing you know the devaluation of their black womanhood I also wanted to talk about you know what you what uh, Lily talked about which is um, sort of honoring someone's life, commemorating someone's life. We deal yeah. with really difficult subjects at times and in social justice artwork, you know, the conversation around what happened at the Whitney Museum and this painting that um, a white female painter created of Emmett Till. I actually love Dana Schutz's work. She's one of my favorite painters. Um, and uh, I was surprised. I wondered why Emmett Till. Um, uh, there are other paintings in this particular exhibit made by other people, such as Henry Taylor, for example, who has a painting of Philando Castile, who was killed in his car by police as he was removing a gun from, um, from himself, from his person. Uh, his girlfriend was in the car with him. She was driving. He said, he went to reach, he said, yes, I am armed. I'm a security officer at a school. 
at a, and he was like a cafeteria, you know, security guard, and he was actually killed. The officer killed him. I think it was an Asian officer, actually. Not to say that all Asians kill black people, but I'm just saying it just, it's interesting to note that it's not always white police who are, um, you know, doing these bad things. But the um, painter, Henry Taylor, is a black man. Yes, he's also black. But I, my point is that um, in painting these moments, um, Lily and I have had conversations about which moment do we paint. Mm -hmm. And we, she and I, have had conversations about feeling a responsibility to not paint the exact moment that the tragedy occurs, mm -hmm. but maybe afterward or before. But really what our goal is, is to give humanity back to you know, the victim and show them as a full person with relationships, with people who love them and care about them. And, um, and that's really, really important to us. And so, I mean, I see that different artists make different choices, but I stand by my choice that is my intention in my work not to show, uh, not to, uh, there's actually a term, it's called reification. So not to show that tragic moment, but moments around it for that reason. Mm -hmm.